Welcome everyone, Nemo Sundry here. This is a public report that I presented originally on February 24th, 2020 to the Minnesota Olmsted Sub-Cabinet, a special committee for the state of Minnesota uh, through the government uh, for anybody to report abuse, neglect, um, safety hazards against vulnerable adults. So I worked in this uh, housing program at the main location was Kimball Court. It's run by one of the largest uh, homeless and housing nonprofits in the state of Minnesota called Common Bond Housing. But uh, the main location where I worked was Kimball Court, and that's a permanent supportive housing program for adults. And I also worked at another location a handful of times called American House. Both of these are in St. Paul. And the abuses, the corruption, the neglect, the total remarkable in-your-face apathy that I saw there from the staff and the despondence and misery I saw in the residents was shocking. It's really some of the worst abuse and the most corrupted and tragic environment I've witnessed in my life. It's really in, in the top five. And this is not an isolated incident. I'm continuing to do this work and present this publicly and gather more and more information and experiences and examples. This is just one of many, many housing programs that are like this. And I believe one of the core driving forces of this and why it is so widespread and why we're seeing this really across the U.S. in a lot of major cities well, it's primarily because of a program that was introduced federally that to some extent nationalized the government and nonprofit response to homelessness. Uh, and the program that was federally introduced, I believe in 2009, is called Housing First. And it was introduced by the Obama administration. I haven't memorized all my terms yet, but you can look up Housing First and get kind of a, a, the general picture of what it is. Uh, and a lot of these standards for applicants getting into these programs have been essentially erased. A really good book that gives a good overview on the problems as they've evolved in the last decade is uh, Answers Behind the Red Door behind, by Michelle Steeb. So I'll link to that and some of her work. Uh, she's incredibly experienced in this field and it exemplifies the devastating changes that Housing First has brought us. But today, I'm going to go through just uh, this one experience I had over this brief time period at Kimball Court and the report uh, just as a case study. So let's dive right into it. Here is Kimball Court Neglected, Dangerous, and Disempowered. Context. If you are reading this report, please take the urgency of these crises seriously. Also know that the analyses and recommendations presented here likely won't be found as common knowledge. It is so valuable to showing why Kimball Court and related programs turned into toxic monstrosities. This is a cautionary tale on what happens when you punish responsibility and reject self-determination. In the end, my goal is to support liberation for myself and all people who desire it. We could build a transformed program that leads by example, fostering authentic community, healing, and autonomy. I'm going to pause here. As a quick side note for timeline, this was also, right when I released this publicly in February 2020, I was in about halfway through a research paper that I released June of 2020, and that is called Fostering Autonomous Age-Integrated Communities. And so a lot of the deeper philosophy you see here when you see phrases like self-determination, keywords like fostering, authentic community, healing, and autonomy, uh, I exemplify some of my research and my growing philosophy on how you can actually do that in that paper. All right, quick list of issues. Dozens of trespassers 24-7 blocking, squatting in bathrooms, such severe lack of community that res residents can't discern trespassers, hazards like needles, blood spatter from heroin, sewage, water, poop, mold, and more. Flooding kitchen sinks and bathrooms usually due to maintenance issues being neglected. General ma maintenance issues neglected for three to eight months, such as broken stoves, extreme heat loss, unsecured mailboxes. 
Exit, entry doors, and fob systems neglected until they break, and people are almost stuck inside, outside, or anyone can get in. So they're either stuck inside, they're stuck outside, or it's a free-for-all. All All three of those have happened, just to clarify that. Individuals constantly drunk or high and in conflict with others or attacked or mugged. Frequent stealing of anything movable. Uh, Police show up every other day on average, often doing nothing. Frequent lease violations and eviction notices with intent to criminalize residents or alter facts. Domestic violence issues and vulnerable adult abuse. Personal, medical, and mental health issues fester for weeks with nobody checking in or helping. Frequent threats of fights or violence by guests, trespassers, or residents towards others. No program structure to provide support for vulnerable, dependent individuals or focus on empowerment. Now, here's the summary. The motto of Kimball Court could be accept, neglect, evict, based on the problems and real impacts of the system here. First, the applicants with the highest level or most challenging needs and who are least likely to make positive improvements are accepted to the program. Then, they are neglected and left on their own. There is no actual program. No weekly activities, no van to take residents to events, no support groups or future planning, nothing. Most people accepted to the program are exiting crisis, but through neglect, prolonged crisis makes every day a disaster until it turns into a lifestyle. When you get 70 to 100 people, residents plus their most frequent guests, in the same living space, all in crisis or deep disempowerment, it creates a whole new kind of monster by combining everyone's crises. It gets so much worse, and not even the wisest and most skillful person around these issues could find a way to transform or resolve such an entangled mess. Once these festering problems erupt more visibly, whoever is at the center of the visible issues will be evicted and or trespassed. This happens to people who weren't actually involved, or worse, those who took responsibility to find real solutions. In the end, responsibility and initiative are punished, whether coming from residents or staff. Self-determination and empowerment are either ignored or treated as wrong. Staff and residents have been normalized to the current structure so much that any suggestions to grow relationships, life skills, and independence are seen as completely alien, even irrelevant. While it is sad to watch a ghost town, barely a shadow of any genuine community, it's an outright tragedy to see how it degrades all of us over time. Health decaying, potential squandered, ultimately leaving behind a parasitic, impoverished world. We can do so much better, and I'm here to start that path. Section 1. Who's Accepted? High Needs, Anti-Empowerment. As said in the summary, the applicants accepted are typically very high needs and simultaneously the least likely to make positive developments. Applicants who desire responsibility, empowerment, and pursuing self-determination in their lives are often overlooked and ultimately punished, while applicants with the, quote, worst hardship are prioritized. This is a major problem across the transitional housing field and especially perpetuated by coordinated entry. So coordinated entry is a a common system used by governments that is a, the goal is to unify a lot of nonprofit programs with an emphasis on housing and homeless issues. It's supposed to be a kind of one-stop shop to help people apply for housing programs so that you're connected in this whole system. And there's this universal, universal form of measurement So that's the goal of coordinated entry, but uh, since it was introduced and implemented in Minnesota in approximately 2016 through 2017, in my direct experience in this field, it's been a disaster. And it's one of the biggest negative side effects is that it is a barrier for the uh, best candidates for programs to get accepted. And this is tying into Housing First, where they are starting to prioritize applicants that are quote-unquote at the bottom have it worst and they're punishing applicants who want to become empowered 
The last side note I want to make here is transitional is the key word here. Part of Housing First and the devastating impact it's had is there's been a massive shift away from transitional housing programs that by very nature of their definition is that people transition from their state of disempowerment to being empowered and independent. But these programs have been replaced exponentially by permanent supportive programs or permanent supportive housing, PSH. As it turns out, and I learned this after I started working there, Kimball Court is not a transitional housing program. It's permanent supportive. With that in mind, let's continue. Even if Kimball Court was a higher quality version of its program, the residents accepted would far exceed the capacity of care. High needs include multiple of the following issues. One, health long-term and or serious health issues, physical, mental, and or trauma. Two, housing and stability, history of chronic homelessness and or disenfranchisement from society and basic needs. Three, job and finances, extremely limited or no employment and professional development, thus financially entrapped. Four, addiction, higher needs addiction issues, particularly opioids, meth, and severe alcoholism. 5. Social. Limited skill in building relationships and conflict resolution. Vulnerable to abuse or dysfunction. And most residents have at least two on this list. Many, many residents, I would say, they could meet four or even all five of these. So... Most residents have limitations and higher level or more complex needs in many areas above and beyond. It creates bigger gaps between neighbors, making conflicts more challenging with more advanced empathy needed. Across all categories, the norm is a higher demand for resources and much fewer available. There is so little care and interaction with residents and far higher needs applicants are accepted then the program could support even in its best state. Managers here have often complained issues as being the fault of residents, picking out one or a few people for each incident. The accuracy of these claims can vary wildly. In the worst cases, residents have pleaded with us for help in dire circumstances, are still neglected, blamed, and evicted. That being said, because so many of the wrong applicants are accepted and neglected, they often exhibit choices and behavior that is damaging, dangerous, or creates conflict. These choices are pointed to by managers to explain the problems and absolve staff of any responsibility. While everyone is responsible for their own actions and choices, that includes staff. We need to be looking critically at the horrible design of this program and take responsibility as a team. Now, as we go throughout, there's going to be these little italic points that are numbered, and this is my list of recommendations that is also summarized at the very end. So my first recommendation, number one, is applicant standards. Create a clear picture of the ideal applicant for our program and use that as guidance for who we accept. Set standards that value responsibility and empowerment. All right, number two, section two, staff standards. No communication. Solutions discouraged. This documentation and report was sparked in November when I got fed up with poor standards and definitions of our roles. So that was November of 2019. I was hired as the equivalent of a resident assistant, even though it goes by another name, which was a uh, site desk assistant to be technical. If we had an actual program here, I would be assisting with leading and supporting the daily activities that form a larger picture of community healing, and empowerment. In my first three months, I took over the bulletin board, designed a coordinated entry resource page, and an emergency phone numbers page. My posts were either taken down or ignored by staff. As I got to know residents in various conversations, I would hear about their challenges and unmet needs. I found unnatural opportunities to refer them to a variety of resources and programs. It was exactly what I wanted to do most when I applied and interviewed with Catherine, my manager, for this job. However, repeatedly I had been contacted by both Catherine and William, the assistant manager, explaining that my references and support were crossing boundaries and actually bad. 
The bounds of my job were continually dimin diminished until I had almost nothing to do. I was reduced to security, but ultimately rejected this anyway. The damning situation that made me start documenting for this report was a squatter incident that escalated to hostage level and got two residents evicted for trying to take responsibility with no help from staff or police. Yes, so in other words, to really emphasize this, there was somebody being held hostage by a squatter in their own room. You know, at a certain point, it's so toxic and you are so entrapped, you have to ask, what can you possibly do to take responsibility, say, as a resident? Like, people who are extremely disempowered, they have very, very few skills, if any, to actually take responsibility and take on this degree of a burden. Anyways, so Catherine called me specifically to tell me not to give out info to Legal Aid. Legal Aid is a nonprofit here in Minnesota that uh, gives out free legal support. Uh, one of their special areas is for tenants and renters. So she t my manager told me not to give out the info for Legal Aid, or quote-unquote, we might have to keep her housed, and that's one of the residents here. This was the point where I was fed up. It was obvious I was alone in my values, and the program was designed to neglect residents. Sadly, Catherine, William, and Ashley from Avivo, Avivo is the case management company, have all expressed that I, as a nighttime assistant, should not be solving these problems or referring to resources at all. So here's the second recommendation I make. Transition, quote-unquote, site desk assistants to genuinely become resident assistants and encourage us to all design new program features in collaboration with residents. Proactively communicate across all staff better. Section 3. Program Structure. The Results of Rejecting Empowerment. In summary, the following aspects form a dysfunctional program. 1. Accepting the wrong applicants. 2. No actual program support structure. Three, segregation of staff structure with no communication. Four, severe neglect. Five, surveillance, punishment, and abusive tactics used by managers. Nobody in this program can handle these problems alone. It's overwhelming. I would love to work with the management and my coworkers, but we have no cohesion as a team whatsoever. This is made much worse by having the division between Avivo doing case management and Common Bond doing property management. Case management often advocates for residents' protection without trying to improve responsibility or acceptance requirements for the program. Property management does the opposite by trying to punish residents every chance possible, even twisting or exaggerating facts to make the worst possible case. Their goal is to be ready to evict residents whenever possible and minimize liability, hence why case managers and residents alike act defensively. Case management advocates for residents' care while robbing them of responsibility, and property management relies on criminalizing residents dishonestly without due process, also robbing them of responsibility. Altogether, it violates autonomy and leaves people powerless. Catherine and William have attempted to control the program by becoming rigid, making rules drastically more narrow, hyper-surveilling to actively seek out rule-breaking and intimidating actions threatening residents with eviction. On one hand, because they have repeatedly ignored residents' complaints and haven't tried to build an actual program, residents have no relationships with management and have no respect or trust. The managers mainly communicate with residents through typed notes. They almost never actually talk face to face, and even then it's only a few words, until the resident is, fa is faced with threats of eviction and has to sit down for a, quote, last chance agreement meeting where they are demanded to change everything immediately and do it perfectly or face immediate eviction. As you can guess, this leads to eviction within days to a week. This is no way to influence a person to make improvements in their life. It's especially degrading to know that the managers reject empowerment and self-determination, then demand residents make changes for managers' convenience without any consideration to provide a support network to make realistic improvements. After being, having been neglected for so long, they've been corrupted by the program. Managers treat residents 
as if they only care about liability and rules and don't care to take action or responsibility. At best, this is hypocrisy. But I think it's something much worse. Here's recommendation number three. Build a program. Drastically pull back from punishment, replacing it with conflict mediation, fostering community, and meeting everyone's needs. Encourage responsibility and connect to free amenities. Here is section four. Safety, isolation, chaos, mystery. So I guess safety is the headline, and the description is isolation, chaos, mystery. One of the ongoing safety issues is frequent trespassers. Most trespassers are barely guests in some way. They find the building through a resident they know. Resident boundaries vary widely. Some residents are very social and try to find new friends through street culture, but end up hurt, so end the relationship. Many residents, for a variety of reasons, are vulnerable to abuse, manipulation, scamming, and leeches. Kimball Court is so interconnected with street culture, homeless populations, addiction-ridden communities, and poverty that residents are often overwhelmed with demands and conflicts from bad friends who cross boundaries, leech, steal, abuse, and or enable each other's addictions. So here is recommendation number four. Help trespassers. Create resource lists and provide help to trespassers. Act respectfully like they are any other human being. Provide real options so they are confronted with their own choices and not at the mercy of staff. This doesn't mean to get rid of boundaries, but in the face of setting boundaries and escorting them to leave the property, breaking up fights, uh, and so forth, that you also provide this assistance because this program is entrenched in these extremely disempowered environments. So uh, just badgering people creates this constant cycle of authoritarian abuse that doesn't do anything. Let's continue. The isolation here is so bad that residents often can't tell the identity of people, whether they're residents, guests, or trespassers. Likewise, the isolation perpetuates this total chaos because staff and residents have no cohesion or aligned aim to effectively respond to safety issues or genuinely resolve the trespassing issue. In many cases, residents or guests are confronted with hostility and fear by another resident who thinks they're trespassing. Management increases the heavy restrictions, putting the building on lockdown. Sadly, this only creates a tense, hostile, and antisocial environment that perpetuates the isolation and disconnect in action. This means the attempted solutions make it harder to reach real solutions, what we actually need. Recommendation number five, ID system. Create an ID badge system to consistently differentiate residents and guests from trespassers. Picture IDs for residents, guest passes for that's a typo. Guest passes for guests in exchange for their ID and publicize pics and names of trespassers. Section 5. State of the building. Decay. Disrepair. Danger. The building itself is neglected until crises explode, mirroring the so social structural issues. Maintenance is called in after hours for emergencies so often, at least every month and up to two or three times a week. General problems include stoves and ovens in disrepair to five to eight months, weak kitchen cabinets broken into easily and re-keyed three times since I started working here, first, and, first floor and second floor twice, pipes and water issues are ignored until sinks and toilets flood and or break down routinely. Three of the four bathrooms in the basement have been out of order with poop and sewage water all over, neglected for over a month almost two months since December 2019, only improved at the end of January but still in disrepair. The bathrooms on the first floor flooded every week for a month in November. The main causes for flooding and breakdown are due to trespassers overtaking bathrooms and squatting. There's green mold in the second floor North Hall bathroom that has been here longer than I've worked here, despite my maintenance request when I first saw it this summer. A bathroom on the third floor had the sink damaged over the last month so badly it fell off the wall. 
All bathrooms in the hallways have a lock design on the door handle that means you can unlock it from the outside using a coin, any key, or similarly shaped object. Trespassers are very tempted to come on site repeatedly for the restrooms because they are often left alone. Many people wouldn't want to unlock a bathroom door and disturb someone's privacy. So here's recommendation number six, master key system. Create master bathroom and kitchen keys for residents to dissuade trespassers. Alternatively, create a key card system or both manual keys and key cards in combination. So this works with the uh, ID system recommendation. And you can experiment, you know, to specify what the exactly the best model is. Among trespassers, guests, and residents are consistently people who use heroin in the bathrooms. Needles are found on the floor or flush down the toilet, hence the flooding and damage. In October, management installed sharps containers, which were too flimsy. Some heroin users would break into the containers to see if the needles had heroin left or reuse them. Within a few weeks, the containers in all bathrooms were gone, so people went back to flushing them, leaving them in the trash or scattered. Recommendation number seven, needle destruction. Install needle destruction devices that melt needles entirely, dissuading users from breaking sharps containers and breaking toilets by flushing needles, also increasing overall public health safety. The front door has multiple problems that result in any of the following. Not opening from the inside, people can't get out, not locking after opened, anyone can get in, and or the fob system not working, nobody can get in. These problems got worse throughout November, December without staff follow-up of any kind. Multiple times I got stuck looking for solutions and couldn't even find a company that served us. Finally, at the end of January, I got part th way through the problem, though days later still have gotten no follow-up on that that any other staff took over the issue. Uh, recommendation number eight is emergency plans. Create master lists of emergency repair contacts for staff and residents. Also create emergency action plans for staff and residents. All right, and then at the very end here, windows are often broken and left in disrepair for three to eight months, even during cold weather. Otherwise, 70 to 80% of the windows don't fully close and have a half inch open at the bottom, leaking cold air in winter months and raising the heat cost exponentially. On top of that heat cold issue, the air conditioning has been broken for over seven months. According to maintenance, it's pumping hot air into the third floor, making it 85 degrees so residents open windows in summer. Recommendation number nine, community renovation. Assess the entire building for repairs and prioritize based on danger or risk, time until emergency, and cost of repair. Involve residents in community re renovations to foster relationships and genuine care for the building. So the residents get that want to participate get to partake in actually fixing things uh, within, you know, with some discretion and boundaries, you know, like planting a new garden around the building. Section six, economic disease, irresponsibility and extreme waste. If you walk on site, you would think they barely spend a hundred dollars per resident in monthly cost. We are running a luxurious slum. Yet the managers routinely say we can't afford overnight security. When the pipes are neglected until repeat sink and toilet floodings, it makes me question just how many more thousands we're losing that could have been saved with preventative care. When I hear what I hear people talk about makes me concerned that we're receiving insanely high funding and it's almost completely wasted. Based on what I've already laid out, such as the state of the building section, it's already obvious Kimball Court is wasting tens of thousands of dollars every month, if not more than anyone could possibly imagine. Just look at the damage to the building alone due to neglect and trespassers. I have to say our most valuable asset is our time as staff. Yet look at the evening staff being directed to do no, almost no work at all. Instead of running a real program and community, Management ends up spending their time on paperwork, surveillance, lease violations, and evictions. Recommendation number 10, prevention and empowerment. Divert current resources from damage control and punishment-based strategies to preventative and empowering strategies that will become a real program. Spend the money ethically on a real program. 
Section 7. Harm Increased, a Trap for Addiction. Kimball Court, American House, and others are defined as harm reduction buildings, intended to reduce harm for residents with addiction. Sadly, the building creates an environment that strongly perpetuates and deepens addiction for almost everyone. Many people in the building don't have jobs due to financial dependence. Combine this with their pre-existing addictions, isolation, and a harsh environment, and addiction goes off the deep end. Even more resilient people end up in decline. So even the more resilient people end up in decline. A person who would otherwise drink alcohol occasionally now gets drunk a few times a week. Worse, their stability and self-control deteriorates and in a drunken state, escalates more each incident. Incident. There's a general air of aimless stagnation. Working with people in this state who live together is brutal. It reinforces their conviction that life is a prison, and they are stuck in this hell forever. Many people don't recognize the way their addictive tendencies drive them into repeating the same choices, which keeps them stuck and robs them of healing. A significant number of residents, at least 30% who deal with addiction or a bad habit, have wanted to make changes and pursue empowerment in their lives. Many have talked about this openly, and some have made the first attempts to leave their addiction behind. But almost all have relapsed, simply being in a fragile state with very limited understanding of how their addiction functions. Genuine recovery and healing is distant. Recommendation number 11. Collab on Rehab. Collaborate with residents to create recovery supportive community, connecting them with trauma and mental health care. Transition re residents to rehab or dual diagnosis programs that can better help them than us. Yeah, the addiction makes it a highly specialized issue, and that is a reality at hand here. And the concept of harm reduction in practice usually results in harm increased. So if there are ways to reduce harm, certainly it's a wonderful idea. Um, it's a response to the war on drugs, so I definitely empathize with that, and I'm aware of it. But these kinds of programs going this direct direction is actively increasing harm, and it's toxic. All right. Here's the conclusion. We need to look at the big picture and envision both our ideal program and ideal candidate as sources of inspiration. What are their values? What do they currently struggle with the most? What is their story with disempowerment? Why do they need our help? What do they want most for their future? What are their biggest mistakes and failures? How is their trauma manifested? What are their greatest strengths? How do they wait, relate to responsibility, work, and self-determination? But there's one question above all else, which ignited a fire within me. It uprooted the way I look at people and their potential. In the summer of 2019, not long after I started working at Kimball Court, I had a sudden realization overnight. A question struck me, which became writing and ultimately, a video. Here is a quote. What if you could become the truest expression of who you are? You would be a gift to us all, and I would want nothing more than to be in your presence. That quote was from the video, Because Your Presence Alone is a Miracle. So that is the Kimball Court Report, a case study of what it looks like to see a permanent supportive housing first based housing program. And this is what happens with housing first. It is partial, partially nationalizing the government and nonprofit structure and response to homelessness. And it's an absolute disaster. So it's high time that we expose this and we start to say no we will not accept these programs being as remarkably toxic and dysfunctional and evil as they are so we got to put their feet to the fire um, if you want more information or if you have any questions you can always contact me 
nemosundry at gmail.com. I take all kinds of stories of people that have experiences in these programs and that want to take action or make a difference. Uh, so you're welcome to share your story with me privately or go public with it. Uh, and there's, there's plenty of ways that I can provide support um, locally in Minneapolis-St. Paul and to a, an extent uh, nationally across the U.S. So um, that's it for now, folks. I greatly appreciate you watching, and get out there and be an example for empowerment.